Thanks for coming. So make sure I've got time right here, everything. Um, I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies and Director of the Project on Chinese Business and Political Economy here at CSIS. And it's wonderful to have all of you here this afternoon um, for this wonderful book event uh, with Carl Minzner. I've been looking forward to this event for a very, very long time. Uh, and I know Carl has as well. Um, uh, Carl's been writing about this question for a few years now, and when he, he had an article in the journal Democracy, uh, which really turned uh, a lot of attention to this topic, and I knew this book was coming, and uh, when I received it a couple weeks ago and read it, I was just uh, really excited that we had the good fortune of being able to host him here. Uh, and I think uh, you all will enjoy today's event, and if you haven't uh, got the book yet, you, uh, I think you should. And you're able to because it's on for sale. It's for sale just behind you. Uh, and there'll be a book signing afterward as well. Um, let me uh, give you a little back, more background about Carl. And then he's going to make a presentation about the book. Uh, we'll then sit down for uh, a short conversation. And then we'll open up the conversation to everyone else here, if that sounds OK to all of you. Uh, so. Carl is uh, an expert in, in Chinese law and governance. He's a professor of law at Fordham University. He previously was at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he also was a senior counsel for the Congressional Executive Commission on China, and he's worked in private practice and clerked on the federal bench. He knows an amazing, amazing amount about China not just about the law, but about politics, society, culture, the economy, China's international relations. Uh, really, uh, an incredibly wide base of knowledge and interest, which provides the foundation for taking on such a big topic. Uh, he's published in um, leading law journals. Uh, he's written major reports. Uh, op-eds in the popular press from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, and elsewhere. Um, he's got uh, a terrific educational background, uh, master's in international affairs and a JD from Columbia, uh, BA from Stanford. Uh, now he's taken on a huge topic, um, all of China, uh, in this book, uh, End of an Era. Uh, and he's going to explain why he thinks China has arrived at the end of an era and, and where it's heading. But I want to emphasize an, another type of end of an era, which I th hopefully this book uh, is, is bringing forth, uh, which is the end of an era when it's OK for academics to stay in their ivory tower when there are important public issues related to their work. Carl is setting a fantastic example for all of his colleagues in any of the disciplines uh, that when there's a lot going on that you know about, uh, it doesn't make sense to leave it to journalists, uh, business folks, consultants, even think tankers like us, that academics have a lot to share uh, and a responsibility to do so. Uh, we're really glad that he's taken up this responsibility, and I think you will too. So please join me in welcoming Carl Minzner. Uh, thanks so much to Scott. That's very kind. And um, it's, it's a real honor to be here uh, at CSIS today. Ironically, about 10 years ago, I was a fellow at CSIS for about seven, about three months. Your other location, uh, it's great to be here in your, in your new location. But I, I sort of can credit you guys uh, partially for sort of giving me uh, an early era or early opportunity to flesh out some of the ideas that I'm currently thinking about. Um, the two sentence summary. The two-sentence summary of the book is that China's decades-long reform era is ending, and that economically, ideologically, and politically, China is moving into a new post-reform or a new counter-reform era that differs dramatically from what we've known since the late 1970s. And in this talk, what I'm going to do is to set out the broad overall argument, and I'm going to explain why I'm worried. Um, but I'm going to specifically focus on the political component of the book, uh, since that's what I'm getting asked most about, and explain how China is experiencing uh, the erosion of its reform era political norms and institutions. It helps, of course, in thinking about China to start with a very brief overview. Um, for the first three decades of the People's Republic of China, the Maoist era, China looked like this. Economically, it was stagnant. 
Pervasive rural poverty and a failed state-run economic model had left the country by 1978 with a per capita GDP lower than that of India or Zaire. Ideologically, it was relatively closed to the outside world. Uh, not only were Western capitalist and Soviet revisionist practices decried, but all religions and Chinese tradition itself were ruthlessly suppressed in the name of socialist modernization. And politically, China was unstable. On the elite level, power was highly concentrated in a single leader, and he had a tendency to regularly purge his designated successors, one of whom, Liu Shaoqi, died in a, after a beating in a prison cell, and the other, Lin Biao, who perished in a mysterious plane crash in Mongolia after apparently fleeing to the Soviet Union, why attempting to flee to the Soviet Union after a failed coup. And within society at large, Mao preferred ruling through disruptive street movements and political campaigns uh, that targeted his enemies of the day, rather than regular institutions of governance. Party and government institutions themselves uh, dissolved during the decades-long period of chaos known as the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. For the second three decades of the People's Republic of China, what we call the Reform Era, China looked like this. Economically, China experienced rapid economic growth. Market reforms launched in the 1980s led China to average 10% GDP growth per year, for every year, over the next three decades. And in the 1980s in particular, this was a broad-based economic growth that lifted all boats, particularly that of the rural poor. Ideologically, China opened up. In Deng Xiaoping's famous words, doesn't matter if a cat is black or white, as long as it catches a cat, it's a good cat. And within the Chinese state and within schools and within other institutions, this gave a whole host of actors latitude to freely import concepts and ideas and practices from abroad. The party also backed out of people's lives. The ideological fervor of the Maoist era faded. Religion came back. Muslim mosques and Christian churches and Buddhist temples reopened. Socialism began to fade into a series of meaningless slogans that were recited on state television broadcasts, uh, but you know, privately, you know, as long as you didn't cross that key line of attempting to organize politically, you had a great degree of flexibility to do what you wanted uh, in your private life. And politically, Chinese party leaders supported a range of partially, and I'm going to underline partially, institutionalized reforms, political norms, uh, that uh, in large part to address the chaos uh, and instability that many of them had personally experienced uh, under, uh, the, uh, under, the, under the Maoist era. Um, you know, one example of that is you know, Deng Xiaoping himself, his son was thrown out of a three-story window, ended up paralyzed by, uh, by Red Guard. So this was not a this was not a, you know, an abstract concept of the risk of instability for that generation of leaders. Now, these reforms that Chinese leaders themselves launched were not political liberalization. Particularly after Tiananmen Square in 1989, Beijing drew a hard line at anything resembling you know, that political liberalization. Rather, if you're thinking about what took place in the reform era, particularly in the 90s and the 2000s, but even, even earlier in the 80s, what happened was the rules of the one-party political uh, game became somewhat more predictable and organized. A sampling of these types of partially institutionalized norms would include designation by Deng Xiaoping of his next two successors, Hu Jintao, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Jiang Zemin and then Hu Jintao, uh, which ensured an unusual period of elite political stability in the 90s and 2000s. Um, development of internal norms regarding the regular promotion, uh, retirement, and succession of top party leaders. Partial depoliticization of the bureaucracy with party leaders retreating from an effort to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of state and turning that responsibility, or at least much of that responsibility, over, over to technocrats within the bureaucracy. A steady institutional differentiation with top party leaders exercising more clearly defined portfolios. And the emergence of bottom-up input institutions, local elections, administrative law channels, and a partially commercialized media that aired, you know, sort of uh, popular grievances, which all of which gave citizens a limited degree of voice into the political process and contributed to state legitimacy. In short, if we're summarizing this era, the reform era, we're thinking about an era that's marked by rapid economic growth, a degree of ideological openness, and a relative political stability marked by partial political institutionalization. Now we're entering a new era. We can, all three of those things are ending, and I'm going to walk through them in turn. You can debate a little bit over the, the 
the, the dates, uh, which are relevant dates. Some of the trends actually extend back over a decade, but uh, they become particularly clear since 2012. Economically, China is undergoing a seismic shift. China's era of rapid economic growth is starting to come to an end. Now, if you're an optimist, you're going to point to secular shifts and demographic shifts in the economy that will lead it to follow the track of Japan and Taiwan as it gradually plateaus at a lower level of growth uh, after this sort of really dramatic uh, period of rapid growth. Um, Pessimists are going to flag a series of what they see as unsustainable pressures in the Chinese economy that they think could la la result in a hard landing, uh, including the buildup build up in debt levels. But it doesn't matter if you're an optimist or a pessimist. One way or another, what you've been accustomed to over the last three decades is coming to an end, and you're moving into something new. Ideologically, China is gradually turning in on itself again. This is showing up both in society, uh, so there's a renewed popular interest in Confucianism, there's a proliferation, one of the examples I like is the, the proliferation of the Han, the, the Fo Han Dynasty clothing, which is showing up often in college graduation ceremonies, um, and it's also showing up in state actions, such as Xi Jinping's 2013 visit to the birthplace of Confucius Chufu, and his declarations that the Communist Party, after having spent the better part of the 20th century attempting to wipe out Chinese tradition and Confucianism and any, her, you know, all of China's own historical heritage. Now, the new declaration is that uh, China needs to embrace these and fuse them with nationalism and Marxist-Leninism into state ideology. Now, when you're thinking about these trends, it's important to recognize that uh, the part of this just reflects a renewed interest on the part of Chinese citizens in their own culture. Many people are beginning to understandably question, now that China has risen, shouldn't we perhaps take more of an interest uh, in our own culture and our own traditions, rather than simply absorbing all this stuff from the outside, uh, as was the case in the 80s and 90s. But while that's, that's clearly one trend, it's also important to realize that there is a big shift that's taking place, uh, a strategic effort on the part of Chinese leaders who are attempting to deploy Chinese tradition as a shield against foreign values, particularly Western ones. There's a sense among party, the party elite that the collapse of communism as an ideology has less, left a spiritual and a moral void at the heart of Chinese society that's permitted a whole range of foreign influences to sort of gradually come into China that they, they think are problematic. And these include things from underground house, house church, Christian house churches to Western liberal, liberal ideals to influences from uh, Islamic influences from uh, the Mideast and outside China. And the sense is, if you're a party ideologue, is these things are problematic and you need to figure out how to deal with them. Uh, how do we struggle against them? And one of the answers that they're grappling with or they're, they're coming to, they're beginning to deploy is the idea that China needs to reassert its own cultural and historical identity as a shield against some of these influences. And so you're seeing this with uh, a really clear rollout of central efforts to pivot with respect to textbooks, with respect to academia, and increasingly in, in, in terms of what you're seeing in mass media uh, as well. Um, now, I'm going to say one more thing about the ideological stuff and then shift to the political side. Um, when you shift to this more clear and closed narrative about what it means to be Chinese, it has a one other effect as well, which it begins to amplify tensions with people in China's borderland regions who fit least well into this, this new narrative. So, for example, when Beijing begins to decide it's going to push patriotic education into the Hong Kong schools, What's the result of that? It fuels a backlash by Cantonese-speaking young Hong Kong youth who feel my identity as a Cantonese-speaking Hong Kong youth doesn't correspond with this narrative that you're requiring me to study or, 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 or vocalize. And that then leads to development of movements like scholarism. It leads to the Occupy Central protests of fall 2014. It leads to a radicalization of the identity of a certain segment of the Hong Kong society. Similarly, if you look at Xinjiang and you see central efforts to sort of tighten controls on the religious and cultural identity of the Uyghur minority, what do you start to see there? Islamic radicalization among some within society. Or you look at efforts to crack down on Christian churches in Zhejiang, uh, both the, the, uh, the re registered and unregistered churches, you start to see an increasing level of clashes with the Christian community there. None of these are imminent threats to China's stability. It's a couple of tens of millions of people here and there, but they're an indication of how things are starting to shift. Now let me move on to the political dimension, which is to say, 
what's going on in politics. Uh, and this is, the, this is the issue that's gotten the most attention because it uh, intersects with what you're seeing play out with the recently concluded um, uh, National People's Congress and then the party con Congress in the fall. Politically, what you're seeing is a breakdown in what we thought were elite estab established elite norms and practices. Since Xi's rise in 2012, he's broken with many of those norms that I'd mentioned that were established in the early reform period. So the fall of the former security czar, Zhou Yong Kong, in 2013 marked the breakdown of tacit reform era norms against targeting former top leaders and their families, uh, particularly from this Politburo Standing Committee. Um, and uh, Similarly, you've seen this range of the ill-defined leadership groups, the Lindao Xiaozu, that have concentrated power that used to be dispersed among a range of other top officials, reconstituted that power in the hands of one person, uh, particularly Xi Jinping himself. And uh, a longstanding aversion to anything resembling a cult of personality is gradually giving way uh, as state media has increasingly focused on Xi Jinping alone to the exclusion of other leaders. If you take a, take a look at the military parade that took place last fall, that's a really clear signal uh, in terms of that. That was just Xi Jinping himself, no other standing committee uh, members. Um, within the past couple months, you've seen other norms fall too. Uh, at the party Congress, 19th Party Congress last, last fall, uh, party leaders you know, didn't name a successor to Xi Jinping. Uh, which was something that you would always have say, seen in advance when you were approaching the second term of his, the, the, the Politburo Standing Committee, the General Party Secretary's term. Similarly, they also raised up his ideological profile within the party charter. Uh, so you get the language Xi Jinping thought on socialism uh, with char Chinese characteristics for a new era uh, dropped into the party charter. And if you look at how he's being referred to in the party charter, compared to predecessors, what you see is that he's been put way above Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. Arguably, he's been put ahead of Deng Xiaoping as well. And some of the language in there also has resonance with the Maoist era. And specifically, one of the things that's, that's going to do over the next couple of years, which is, you guys, if you're China watchers, you should pay attention to, is that's going to give space within the party bureaucracy and state media to begin to air documentaries, to begin to air films that start to uh, illustrate how Xi Jinping himself illustrates all of the ideal car characteristics that party officials themselves should seek to replicate. And actually, if you're interested, you can already start to find this stuff online. Uh, you can look, if you're looking for English language documentaries, find the one Time of Xi. I think that's on YouTube. That's either a CCTV or a Xinhua one. Um, uh, or look at some of the references that are starting to pop up in the popular press. Renmin uh, Lingxiao, People's Leader, that's now become a sort of a standard terminology for, uh, for Xi that's just a little bit lower than what you might have seen used for Mao. Uh, there was one Guizhou paper that I saw that had Wei Da, Wei Da Lingxiao, which was directly a Maoist term, but then that got sort of, they got whacked down. So it's still, you know, it's not fully, but, but this is a big shift from anything that we had seen earlier in terms of the way China's top leader was portrayed. Now, of course, one of the things everyone's been focused on in recent weeks is this, or uh, like months, is the removal of the term limits for the Chinese presidency. I actually sort of thought that was like not the most important thing because, um, okay, you remove the constant, Xi Jinping has three different positions, the military, the party, the president. The presidential one is the least important out of his three titles. And I felt that when you, when you were looking at the developments that I just mentioned with respect to the party Congress in the fall, and you see his ideological profile lifted up, it was really clear which direction things were going. But uh, nonetheless, I think for Americans, it was the shift with respect to his role as the president's president. Removal of two-term limit on presidency. For Americans, we think, well, if, if Trump's limit on two terms was lifted, that would be a big thing. So when we look at China, we're like, ah, that's a big thing too. And in reality, it's like, well, but it's part of this bigger shift that's already been taking place. Nonetheless, that was the thing that when people, that got a lot of attention for the book because that was seemed to be the triggering mechanism where people were like, oh, wow, this is, this is really huge. Um, I'm going to flag one other thing for the China watchers in the audience that I think are worth paying attention to, and that's the repartization of the bureaucracy. Um, remember that the early reform era, those reforms that I'd mentioned, I said earlier the party had, was backing out of day-to-day -day management of the bureaucracy, um, and I think that's eroding now as well. So what you want to do with that is you want to look at the newly announced government reorganization plan. You want to look at the creation of the National Supervisory Commission, and what you're seeing there is the creation of a new body, 
but which is effectively this this it looks to me like the remodeled version of the party disciplinary inspection committee um, as an oversight body for all state employees you take what was formerly a party body only authorized to go after party employees you pull in elements of the state prosecutor the other anti-graft organs you throw it in this new body and now you authorize it to go after anyone who's receiving a state salary what that's going to do is potentially to allow university officials professors state o soe employees to be targeted by this body which is also aimed at political loyalty and are aimed at uh, you know a range of other things in addition to corruption and i think that's potentially going to allow the black box norms that have existed within the party disciplinary ins inspection to start to spread more within the uh, state apparatus the government stuff that's not directly within the state uh, within the party Similarly, if you want to look at that, I think the other thing you should look at, the government reorganization plan, you're starting to see the merger of a range of government organs with party ones. The state civil, civil service board, it's getting merged with the party organization department. The state administration of religious affairs, that's been wiped out and been fused with the party's united front. Now, on the one hand, you can say, well, this doesn't really matter. The party, even under the reform era, was always in control of things. But on the other hand, it does, because you're putting party cadres much more directly in the driving seat of day-to-day -day operations. And I think that's how you get this partial distinction between party and state that had built up over the reform era. That starts to break down, and you start to kind of revert to something earlier. Okay, so quick summary. So if we're thinking about the, 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 the post-reform era, China is ideologically closing up. It's economically slowing down, and the partially institutionalized political norms of the past several decades are starting to buckle. So why is this all happening? Why are these things, why are the political norms coming undone? And I think the core answer is that China had an opportunity to build alternative institutions during the reform era. Uh, but precisely because they didn't go down that path, uh, largely because it's a more complicated answer in the book, but largely because this w adherence to one-party rule meant they undermined many of their earlier efforts. By the time Xi Jinping comes around in 2012, um, you fi he finds himself driven back to yet older methods to make change happen within the system. So the way I think of it is put yourself in Xi Jinping's shoes. You're a committed believer in the party's polit continued political dominance. You sense, as you're coming to power, that party, the China is slouching towards crisis. You see corruption building within the system. Uh, you see a frozen and factionalized system within the party itself. Um, you're worried about the future. Uh, you reject viscerally any move towards political liberalization. What do you do? I think you, you centralize power in your own, his own hands. You sort of do exactly what he's doing. You resort to the levers that you do have. You try to get power back in your own hands. You launch politicized purges of your rivals. You uh, cultivate a populist image among the masses. You try to resuscitate the party architecture. And you promote an ideological shift back towards nationalism and cultural identity. Um, now, some people have argued this means that Xi Jinping is a new Mao. I don't go that far. I think there still are some key reform era norms that have not yet been broken. Uh, the big one is any resort to mass mobilization. Again, thinking back to the Mao era, one of the defining characteristics of that era was mass movements, you know, calling people out into the streets to attack your enemies of the day. No sign of that. And without that, you can't conclude she is a new Mao. But the key point is that the reform era itself is unwinding. And once you think that the political rules, and we're talking core political rules that governed the reform era are starting to come undone, the really operative question is, what's next? What's the next thing that could go? And just to be clear, while I'm telling a story very much of the, of the China-specific story, I'm telling a story of political erosion within China's one-party system, I'm actually not bashing China. Uh, the idea that political norms are breaking down has parallels in a range of societies, in fact, democratic ones. Uh, look at Turkey, uh, look at India, look at the Philippines, maybe even look at the United States. Um, in fact, if I was a US expert, I might tell, try to tell a story where the last, and I'm not a US, US expert, so I'm not pretending to, I mean, this is in the Center for International, so I'm not a US expert, uh, but I, if I was, I might try to tell a story where the last two decades of the 20th century saw a fusion of money and party politics that led to a steady erosion of American political institutions by the early 21st century. Existing norms began to give way. Bipartisan 
ship bipartisan compromise, having a federal budget on a regular basis, uh, Senate rules regarding the use of the filibuster, ideology closed down, there was a turn against immigration and free trade, there was a slide towards alternative mechanisms of governance, direct communication over Twitter, the use of vaguely defined leadership groups of unclear you know, uh, officials, the cult of personality over experience, purge of the heads of the uh, domestic surf security service, FBI, and the diplomatic corps, the State Department. That was, I had to throw that one in like, you know, like a month, like a couple weeks ago. Um, naturally, I think they're crucial differences. In China, what's taking place is a top-down process driven by Xi Jinping and those around him, rather than a bottom-up one, you know, what's taking place in the West, in the United States, is bottom-up erosion because of populist, uh, populist, emerging populist. But make no mistake, the dangers of what are taking place in China are just as severe, if not more so, than in the United States. Because if you're like me and you're worried about the, the things that are happening in this country, I think you also have to start to ask questions about what happens when you see political erosion like that take place in a country like China, where the entire political institutional political architecture is of much more recent vintage, and that history of severe political turbulence is much more closer in time. And that's why I think what's happening is so risky, because I think once, it's like a Jenga set, once you start pulling these things apart, I think some of those underlying problems that plagued the pre-reform era start to come back. They start pushing themselves zombie-like back to the surface again. Uh, and so examples would include local officials competing to exalt the top leader, breakdown of channels of information to the top of the system as people become increasingly unwilling to reflect back negative information. Uh, Efforts to spread party controls back into areas from which they'd retreated in the 1980s. Take a look at what's happening in academia and culture. An erosion in the technocratic capacities of the state and more internal, more vicious internal score settling as within the party elite itself as norms continue to break down. And so on that point, I'd flag some of the language associated with, you know, Bo Xilai, Zhou Yongkang, and Sun Zheng Tsai, where you see some accusations that they were plotting a coup, which is also serious language that we haven't uh, seen for quite a while. And all of that spells trouble. Uh, I think in the short term, it spells, it bodes for a much more hardline, personalized authoritarian state. But in the longer term, I think it's a recipe for a, some, for a revival of some of that internal political instability that many observers had thought was dead and buried with the beginning of the reform era. So I'll stop with that, uh, and I will uh, happy to take, uh, first talk with Scott and then take questions. Thank you. Closing of opportunity 
for sort of for 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 youth for uh, you know if you were thinking about the socioeconomic chapter talks about you know when in the 80s opportunities there were lots of opportunities for lots of people if you were a, a young person coming out of the rural area who was going to work in the city as a migrant you had an opportunity to, to make a better life if you were a um, if you were a young university graduate your life was golden those opportunities have sort of sh gradually diminished so you know rise, rising wealth divide develops uh, the uh, employment opportunities for graduates coming out of college have been tough for since the early 2000s so there is a range of secular shifts there's a range of things that are much longer in scale uh, so I try to describe it you know instead of saying the reform era is like that I sort of look at it as like there's there's a range of opportunities there are things that sort of gradually close down so some of the shifts I would sort of date back to the early 2000s I think they're clear inflection points I think you know 1989 took certain things off the off the off the possibility of like trajectories uh, but it, I don't think it is a, a, a totally sharp break that being said I think as you mentioned there are clear points where things shift more dramatically and 2012 is is one clear thing I think per those particularly some of those core political norms getting break it broken for the last five years you know the fall of uh, of Jo Young Kong in 2013 the uh, the removal of term limits some of those things have become extremely clear uh, over the last five years that makes sense that makes sense a lot um, I guess one of the reasons I was partly I was asking can you can you guys hear me I'm okay Oh, maybe I should give you those too. Oh. Oh. So he's just going to help you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So now we're good. We can put the mic down. Yeah. Can you all hear me? I can. I can talk loud too. If that's yeah. It's okay. just the people on the in the, in okay. the on, on, online. online. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, we're okay. Super. Okay. Terrific. Because um, you mentioned. Um, that what was distinctive about the reform era, uh, you used the words limited, you were partial, you weren't talking about absolutes, you weren't talking about like a purely liberal era or anything like nope. that. Uh, and I noticed in the photograph you had of the reform era, uh, the picture of Shanghai, it was a very recent picture because you had uh, those bigger, the very tall buildings, yeah. which those things only existed in like the last three or four years. So it's, uh, and so that that's why the, the fuzziness of the, and so and mentioning that there are still elements of the reform era yes. here, so we haven't totally gotten them. Right, no, it's, it's sort of the ending of, but with sort of the question of like what, you know, I think it's gonna be, there'll be a histor historians in another, you know, 10, 20 years are gonna be looking back at this period, trying to, you know, put a date on, and I think it's gonna be a, it, it's a little hard to sort of see specifically, but 2012 is an important date, yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, you, you uh, I, I'm really curious uh, about the reaction uh, of your book by, by Chinese by Chinese scholars, by any Chinese officials. It's probably not been reviewed in the China Daily yet, but we would hope so soon. Uh, but how would, uh, what's the react, because when I talk to Chinese people, uh, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying about how, how, how much things have shifted. I typically don't hear that in my personal conversations with Chinese friends. That they, they tell me, I'm imagining that things have shifted, that it actually things haven't changed so much. Uh, that I'm uh, overly, uh, I'm, I'm spending too much time in Washington, D.C. and not enough time in China, that, uh, and that I really don't see the real China. And um, I don't know, have you, what, what's been the reaction so far from when you talk to Chinese? So it's, it, that's an interesting question. And honestly, when I wrote the book, I, you know, and this was like with this, like, a, a, you know, a, a year or two years ago, I was, I was expecting that there was going to be more pushback on the idea of the new era. But, Certainly last fall when, you know, Xi Jinping himself sort of announced it was a Xin Shidai, sort of a new era was dawning, I'm like, well, it's not, not, not me saying that it's an end of an era, it's that you've actually got Xi Jinping himself saying, okay, a new era is dawning, so in, implicitly there is something that's, that's ending. Now, I think there's a little, you know, the, the difference, of course, between, and, I, and I'm perfectly happy if people sort of debate over, you know, whether it's good or bad, but the first operative question is to recognize that we're moving into a new period. And I think that, you know, I can now say, well, it's not me saying it, it's actually, you know, China's top leader has now proclaimed that. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I do think that you're correct, the sort of in the tone, where I'm like definitely saying that I'm, I'm more worried about this. It's, you know, I, I hear different things from different people in China. Some people are like, well, yeah, you know, these trends are going on, but they don't necessarily affect me. But I also hear from a lot of people that 
you know, even if you're a university professor who's sort of still, you see these trends and if you are old enough and you remember some of the things where Chan has come from, you are very worried about some of these developments. You can see the possibility when stuff starts breaking for what could happen next. Um, and so I do think that that, that, that concern is out there uh, even if a lot of people still, you know, they haven't necessarily felt it in their own personal lives yet. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, let me ask a little bit about um, the policy side, because um, I think you're trying to be very careful in the book about making policy recommendations. Right. And, but we're in, in a think tank, uh, and, and that's what we do all day long. Um, and um, and, and uh, so I'm going to ask you to, to do a little bit of, of this as, as well, maybe go a little bit further than what you have in the book. Um, so it, let's assume the reform era has ended. We're in the new era. It's got different norms, different operating uh, system. Um, what should the U.S. do? Should, should the U.S. Um, treat China like it did during the reform era, which was patient, patience, guidance, hope that China will gradually evolve in a, in a direction that's more compatible with our values or at least interests? Uh, or should the U.S. be you know, a little tougher, uh, push back a little bit harder, a little ornery, maybe a little Trump-like. Um, and, and that's just the government. And I know a, a big part of the book also is, is that our relationship is much larger than governments. So in addition to taking on the question about government policy, American universities, uh, American companies, uh, what should our, their broad posture towards China be? Yeah, no, that's 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 a really that's a really good question. And on on the, you know, I am I'm not an expert on sort of the you know national security or the or the or the or the uh, economic issues that you would, and Chris look at. So you know, I'm I'm a little bit at loss for on, on some of those issues. I am, you know, I on the on that broader question of what what should the you know response of society be. I. This is a tricky one because what I do see, and this is the thing I'm really worried about, is I see rising nativism in both countries. And I see that possibility for the, 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 the trends that are taking place here is apart from the, the, there, there, are, there, there, are, there are winds that are beginning to blow in the direction of a sort of a hardline nativist sentiment in China as well as here. I worry that that's the type of thing that on both sides begins to really poison the atmosphere going forward. You know, I think there's a range of things that are perfectly great to, you know, look, both countries are going to have disputes over strategic, over economic issues. But at the point when you start demonizing all the Chinese people or all American people or all foreigners in a particular way, that really, like, that, that's, that's going to worry me. And so, I guess one of my calls is that sort of when you talk about the issue or when you start to, you know, draw that distinction between party, between government, between people. And I'm really worried that in the future, both in, in China and in the United States, what's going to start happening is those distinctions are going to begin to collapse. National security education inside China isn't just going to be about spies, it's going to be about all foreigners or, you know, Uyghurs. Um, and similarly in the United States, that's sort of the discussions that are going on here about, like, what do we do about Chinese influence in this or this? It's going to be, well, is it Chinese influence? Is it ethnic Chinese? What's it? And so I think it's, you know, I, I'm really hoping that in both countries you kind of start, people start to police those boundaries where you're saying, you know, try to resist or curtail, you know, focus on the key issues and burn down on those rather than just letting it seep over into something that then becomes toxic for decades to come because you've untriggered, a, you've triggered a much deeper upsurge in both countries in terms of need of a center. Sure, sure. Well, you, you, you certainly, that, that's very helpful. I mean, you certainly give a good reason why radicalization of Chinese politics leads to radicalization of its opponents, yep. even in the United States or other places. Uh, so what's going on in China is not unique to China. There's, it's happening in, in lots of places. Yep. So. Um, but the, so the, the call for moderation, for reform with a small r, uh, care, right. uh, that's, that's extremely useful and helpful. All right, um, I think we've got enough out there to get the conversation going. I'm going to start here in the front. If you would please identify yourself uh, and keep your uh, question to a relatively short question, that would be terrific. We have uh, microphones that will be coming for the audience that's online. So we're going to come right up here in front to this uh, woman right here. If we would bring it up, the microphone here. 
Thank you. Hi, my question is Ange uh, My question. My name is Angelita. My question is. And your um, institution? Um, I'm a blogger. Okay. And um, my question is, from what I understand, you're talking about reform internally within China. And by 2012, there is a new era which Xi being uh, ushered. And that era, from what I understand, is kind of like a hybrid where Chinese retained the communist philosophy inside China, but then it has opened up to the world, which is economic liberalism. So my question is, US will still be dealing with a communist I mean, a Chinese government under a communist philosophy, although liberally it's economic. So how do you foresee this in the future affecting U.S. policies and, and internationally? So, I mean, it's interesting you said communist. I mean, I sort of, like two days ago, I think, you know, Xi Jinping calls on, uh, on, uh, on the, um, on, on, you know, to read the Communist Manifesto, on all party cadres have to sort of read. I mean, China is the farthest thing from a, it's a one party authoritarian system now, but in terms of class revolution, in terms of the proletariat, you know, uh, rising up against the birth, that's not what the, there is nothing communist in the real sense of the term about the system now other than the fact that it's a, it's a one party system. So the ironic thing is I think probably, you know, many of the issues that, 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 um, that, that, that Scott and Chris are looking at in terms of industrial policy, they've got more resonance with sort of industrial policy that sort of they've encountered with other developing states and you could draw on like issues from Japan. So I think some of these issues that are going to be blow blowing up are actually, it's not, the, the relevant rubric isn't the Soviet Union where there was a sort of one, this battle for ideologies across the world. It's really, you know, China is a one party system that is now di divorced from, from a communist, but it has these, we have strategic issues with them. There are economic issues. It's incredibly, it's, you know, turning in a much more repressive direction. But it's not so much that it's a debate between you know communism and any other form of you know clearly expressed uh, you know, liberal capitalist idea. I just want to clarify the communist philosophy. What I'm referring to is the, hey, you the document number nine, ah, right. which the document number nine is actually um, a discrete uh, document that was distributed to the members right. of the Communist Party in the Philippines. It's I mean in the, the China, but it's pretty much saying that. The dangers are yep. the Western values, the civil society, the human rights, and all that. So pretty much what I'm saying is that even if Xi Ping goes away, you're dealing with the human rights issues where which U.S. should not agree with. So I think, I mean, you're, yeah, you're flagging the document. The, yeah, yes. So one of the things that's going to be a challenge going forward is that during the reform era period, I think it was... There, you could, it was possible for a range of entities, whether they were foreign companies, whether they were civil society organizations, Western academic institutions working in China, you could say there's a degree of gray space. One party control is in the background, but you know, if I'm just a, a joint venture enterprise working in something, or I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a civil society organization working on some environmental issues, I'm not really bumping up against core party issues of one. The, the, the shift that's starting to take place is the party is getting much more interested in a wider range of areas. And so there are groups, Suddenly, corporations are finding, oh, there's actually pressure on me to give some power to the Communist Party cells in my company. Or civil society organizations are, oh, wait a minute, I've got a new registration law that's going to. So I think one of the shifts that's, are, that's taking place, and that's going to be a problem, is these range of other groups are going to start to have to make decisions of, do I comply? Do I back out of China entirely? And I think that's going to be one of the big challenges, apart from sort of what the government does. Those institutions are going to, one at a time, start to feel like, how do I begin to operate in this new environment, or do I just get out entirely? Yeah. i come right next to you here. Thank you. I'm Harley Balzer from Georgetown University. Uh, thank you for the book. Uh, I liked it so much. Uh, I actually bought copies for all the students in the last session of my class tonight. Uh, so a we'll model continue for the discussion. Here. Uh, uh, but you know, kind of to follow up on the economy question, uh, you talked about the party change. You know, the, a bigger change may be the party organizations in economic organizations, and that raises a real question about legitimacy. I mean, I, I wrote something you know, 15 years ago about the mandate of heaven being re replaced by the mandate of mammon. Uh, you know, a lot of what this suggests is that the economic slowdown could get even worse. And what is the alternative legitimacy if it's not the economy? Uh, you know, is it nationalism? Is it great power status? 
Yeah, you're raising. I mean, I think this goes to sort of the look, everything. The the thing the thing that kind of really scares me is the idea that I'm describing the shift. China hasn't had yet sort of the a major problem. I mean, you haven't had the you haven't had the military clash. You haven't had that sort of dramatic slowdown in terms of property prices in Shanghai or Beijing. All of this is taking place before you've had any of those other things, you know, the black swan event that everyone sort of has to hit at some point. And that's what worries me is because when you start pulling this stuff together with the possibility for, you know, or just a pension crisis where you start to have to say, we've got a lot of promises that are out there to sort of older individuals and we don't have, you know, we're in the ill situation of Illinois or Connecticut and we can't, you know, pay back all it. What happens at that point? Uh, and that's what worries me, is because I see I see some things out there where there's this grappling for what are the other narratives that we could use to get legitimacy, you know, starting to identify enemies or problems within our system. Somebody within the within the party system itself deciding that I want to try to use some of the discontent in the way that like we're seeing happen in other systems where you turn sections of the society against other sections and that has resonance within China's own history, that's, I find that really worrying because I, I can start to see how things could begin to spin much more quickly than, 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 is, than, than is happening right now. Yeah, and so I think you put your finger on, you know, that the economic issue is something to watch, which I'm, again, not an economic expert, but yeah. Okay. We're going to come right up here in front while that's coming. I would say one of the other types of legitimacies that they were working right. on uh, was procedural legitimacy, mm -hmm. right? And it seems that they've essentially abandoned procedural legitimacy. Right. right. And certainly some of the, which were, if you were, the reforms that you were looking at, limited reforms in the 90s and early 2000s, village elections. You give people a limited degree of voice into the system. But all of those I view as sort of a one step, one, one step forward, one step back. You open up the village elections in the 1990s. Let's, you know, not, we're not going to challenge one party, but we're going to let more people have some voice into the system. And what happens, people start gravitating to use it, it spreads up the vine to the township, maybe the county level. Party authorities see shades of 1989. We've got to shut that down. So all of those other limited reforms, which you could see maybe evolving into something else, boop, they're, they're, they just get shut down. And now we're in an era where the party is just coming back in a much stronger way. Clara Bilgin, Virginia International University. Um, I would like to follow on um, your discussion just now. Is there an overarching vision of what China would be domestically, and even more importantly, what China would be in the future internationally, let's say in a decade or two? And is it coming from Xiang Xiaoping or is it coming from somewhere else? So, I mean, I think that that's, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, there are many people in Chinese society, one very large country, many different people, lots of different visions of what folks would like. Um, the current vision that's being expressed is very much coming out of, from Xi Jinping and, and, and the center, because that's the officially expressed narrative. And it is now one which is, you know, um, it's strong party, strong country. We're going to lead, you know, China feel proud that China has stood up and that we are you know, great on the world stage. Politically at home, the party is going to sort of play, we're renovating, we're not moving away from the role of the party, we're strengthening the party. Party is going to be reformed as an increasingly strong institution to govern the system. And the question behind the scenes is, what's the ideology that governs the party? How could they possibly renovate? I mean, are you going to really put up a, a face of a, you know, a, you know, an old German socialist as the? That just doesn't work. So my 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 feeling is that gradually that's going to give way to bringing back in some form that Chinese Chinese face, the Chinese tradition, and that's going to get fused as like be proud of our own traditions and that whatever socialism means starts to fade into the background as a meaningful thing. Globally, it's, you know, we're going to have, a, we're going to, we stood up. We're going to, we are exercising our role and people should be proud of, of this. Um, yeah. The problem with Marx is that beard and beards are just not popular right, in official China. Right. And so we're going to come right here, second row here, if we might. Question. Thank you. Uh, I come from Boston, Massachusetts. Oh. I'm Gerald Heng. Oh. Uh, you know the fortune billionaire Warren Buffett oh. has, has gone on record as saying that, you know, China has found a secret source f for making economic results with social cohesion. But we failed to mention to him that the source was stolen from Dr. Henry Kissinger, 
<laughs> and President Nixon on the rapprochement era with Deng Xiaoping. Right. Now, after saying that, Warren Buffett has something more practical to say. He says, well, the London people are saying that, you know, uh, the USA will be overtaken in 20 years to be the top tier number one economic power. Warren Buffett said, no, it's a long way off. Uh, they will do well, but they have got a, a population of 1.5 billion. 1.5 billion, top tier number two, is not good enough to overtake America. Not yet. And of course, uh, Warren Buffett also said that one of the reasons that the, the secret sauce has succeeded is because of the, the social cohesion and politically, there is no dissent. There's no, there's no other party other than one party. And if you protest, you get jailed and then you get the, the propaganda, communist correctness propaganda to teach you how to be a good communist. So basically, we have a problem in the United States because we, we, want, we want China to succeed just as much as Warren Buffett wanted China to succeed because he's a businessman and he's a free market uh, global kind of guy. But with China, with this kind of one party system, oppression, and then President Xi has recently made himself the emperor for life, it's very difficult. And most of the leadership have never been outside having an education, like many of the other Asians that have left a long time ago. Now, isn't that a, a tragedy that there are many Chinese students in America, the biggest, and yet they don't have on the top leadership those that are educated from here? So I, I don't know how you're going to do away with the one-party state. Uh, so, Professor, please. <laughs> Enlighten us. Well, I mean, I, I don't think the Chinese authorities themselves want to do away with a one-party state. I think they think everything is, you know, this is, you know, they look at I, the lessons that they're drawing are not that there is anything wrong with their system. I think they look at they look at you know the Arab Spring, they look at the color revolutions, they look at sort of the fall of the Soviet Union, and they, their answer is we we're doing great. We're we're doubling down uh, on all of the things that we've done before, and why should we do anything? different. Uh, so it's not like I, I think that they think that they do need to fundamentally you know, address anything. My, what I'm trying to point out is I, I think that in doing so, they're eroding some of the core things. I mean, if you really are talking about technocratic flexibility of the Chinese state, if you're thinking about the ability to sort of adapt, uh, adapt carefully to changing times, what you're really talking about is you know, 1980s, Deng Xiaoping reforms, decentralizing power, allowing a, a degree of voice within the system to talk about, should we do this or should we do that? The problem is, as China begins to sort of you know, pursue the track that it's going, it's undoing its own reforms. It's undoing the stuff that it went through in the 1980s. And now everyone is like, well, you know, China's so stable, social cohesion. That wasn't the narrative people were telling in 1978. People were like, oh my god, we're coming out of a period of increase, increasing political turmoil. And what worries me is I start to see these things taken apart as I'm like, yeah, and there's a, very, there's a reason why this stuff was put in in the first place, not by foreigners, not by the World Bank, by Chinese people themselves. And what's the, what could happen if you start undoing this? So yeah, that's why I'm worried. Maybe it's cultural. Well, I don't know. It, it, took, it took Britain 1,000 years to move from the monarchy system to the democratic monarchy system, which is the monarchy right. is just ceremonial. Yeah. Maybe at yeah. some point China should have a ceremonial Maybe. One of the interesting things that's in, in your book uh, is the com comparison and contrast with South Korea and, ah, and Taiwan. Yes. So places with two similar yep. cultural traditions but very different political trajectory. Right. Right. And, and, I, and that's actually, I, I, do, I think that's actually really interesting, thinking about the comparison. And I think that's, people forget the process that when Taiwan and South Korea went through. Again, it was, it was a slow process. Some of the... The short answer is that I think some of those grass level, grassroots reforms that I was saying were sort of shut down in China in like the 80s, the 90s and 2000s, those started, you could see some of those same things, local elections in Taiwan, 
kicking off in the 1970s, and they just gradually expanded over two or three decades. Institutions grew, and they became more, they were allowed that space to develop, and the system shifted. And you know, in China, if I was looking in the 90s and 2000s, I could point to stuff like the, the, the you know, Mengzi, the expert Miao the sort of the, the grass, the, the, the little beginnings of the sprouts that could begin not to change China's one-party system overnight, but could just gradually let politics become somewhat more, the rough edges get, get sanded soft, and maybe it turns into something later on. All those th experiments were, were sort of shot down, and so I think China goes on a very different trajectory from Taiwan and South Korea. Anyway, more questions. I'm going to the far back. Thank you so much, Nicholas Romero, representing myself. My question is, um, China has different characterization, uh, characterizations of its eras, right? So in, in Chinese press, they talk about uh, emerging from the rich China era to the strong China era. And my question is, um, how can she talk like this in the face of negative, the negative changes you're describing? Is it uh, merely lipstick on a pig or is bacon on the menu? And is, uh, what are the examples that she's going to use to demonstrate Chinese strength? Well, I said, I mean, so uh, some people have sort of, you know, asked me about this too, about the idea of like, well, you know, how can you talk about problems when China has sort of lots of, you know, external manifestations of success? You know, they got, you know, aircraft carriers launching things, you know, launching space missions and the like. I don't think it's possible. It's not. It's not inconsistent to say at the same time you've got, you know, China is is much wealthier. It's you know much more influential than it was before. There are these external manifestations of, of power, but at the same time, you have latent internal problems within the system uh, as well. And those two things can sort of exist exactly at the same time. And in some ways, you know, that pointing to those external manifestations of success, that's an effort to sort of the new legitimacy. Like, you know, look, I, it's, it's, you know, there's a wealth gap in China between rich and poor. Uh, you know, the migrant workers or others who might be kicked out of are being kicked out of Beijing or Shanghai because we have difficulties over who's going to pay for the education of their children and do we really want those urban parents are rejecting the idea that the rural kids should be in the same schools with us and where are we going to get the money to sort of provide education for everybody, et cetera, et cetera. One way of sort of trying to say is, well, you know, even if you're unhappy with, the, with X situation, be proud that China itself has stood up. I think there is an element of you know, trying to, what's the narrative that I can tell to make people feel you know, good about themselves? And this, if you're moving away from an era where you could tell a story where everyone, everyone gets rich eventually to one where maybe some people are going to be a lot poorer than others for an extended period of time, you need to have a new narrative that can, you can try to tell. And I think part of that is the, you know, China is stood up on the world stage also. Thanks. I'm Bill Powell. I'm the chief Washington correspondent for Newsweek, um, having just returned here last fall after a decade in uh, China as a bureau chief and a correspondent in um, Shanghai and Beijing. Um, Carl, I, it, the headline of the book is how um, the author authoritarian revival is undermining China's rise. But I'm not hearing how exactly it's undermining China's rise, particularly the fusion of three decades of economic success with now um, an expansive foreign policy strategy, which is married to a far more muscular military strategy as evidenced by, by budgets, by building islands in the South China Sea, etc. How is that just, is it just a nice title to catch a reader's eye, or do you really argue that, that the authoritarian revival is undermining its rise, and if it is, how is it? Right. So the, the argument on that point, it's on a, a couple of different fronts, but the, one of the key ones is the idea that what's taking place now as you're seeing these shifts towards a more personalized authoritarian system, it's beginning to kick the legs out from the political stability that's characterized the post-78 era. You know, if you're really thinking about why China has been politically stable, and it hasn't had that instability of the Maoist era, it's because you didn't have a cult of personality. You didn't have, you know, there was an era in which people woke up overnight and it sort of was like, you know, what, what's, what's, what's law? That's whatever Mao says. 
1978, you move towards an area where Deng says, we're moving towards collective leadership. We're going to have sort of mo more open discussion within the party in order to have you know, space for discussing things. The shifts that are taking place now are really, it's not just a theoretical challenge. They're knocking the basics out from that system. Now, at the moment, people are like, well, there's, what's, what's the problem? How could, this, how could this lead to any problems in the future? The way in which it starts to lead to problems is where you start to get those real struggles between party elites, which did characterize that pre-1978 period, and which we are sort of seeing break out You're the, the, on the sort of technocratic governance side. The way which you know, everyone's like, oh, well, China is a technocratic miracle. It's a technocratic miracle because there have been sort of some good decisions made recently uh, well, re over the last 30 or 40 years. But what happens in an era where people start looking, taking random comments from the top leader and running with them because they're trying to please the boss? I'll tell you one example. Look at the 2015 stock market crash. That was sort of people deciding we want to talk up the you know, stock market because of comments that were made. And all of a sudden, we've got a bubble and that, gets, that bursts. Again, minor problem at the, point, at, the, at the moment, but what happens when this starts? Again, lifetime rule now. This is the type of, this is the new future that's going to begin to come up, that's going to begin to uh, 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 dominate the, the coming years. And that's sort of one of the key arguments of why I think that you're undermining the the, 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 the system of governance that's, char that's characterized the post-78 period. Right. We're going to come to Chris here, and then I'm going to come to the front. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris Johnson. I'm Scott's boss. <laughs> 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 um, I'm, I'm really struck by a theme that's you know, coming through the book, through your remarks, and the last question, which I really um, found quite fascinating, and a few of the other questions as well. Which is something along these lines. You know, you, you posit obviously that you know things really turned in at seventy eight. I certainly agree with that. I think we have to, and we've seen a lot of this um, it, with Xi. You know, making these changes suddenly. Deng Xiaoping is this fluffy guy who never did anything wrong, who didn't fight horrible battles with his enemies inside the system, who didn't preside over the Tiananmen crackdown. Um, and so I think sometimes we look at this period with um, rose-colored glasses. And then I think it, we have to acknowledge the fact uh, that I think has you know, been proven inconclusively with what she has done. And in fact, Hu Jintao really didn't run the country. Um, Jiang Zemin really did, uh, to a large part. Uh, and um, therefore, a lot of these sort of ideas of collective leadership and so on were somewhat false. Um, and, and in fact, you can argue that there's the view that she was put there precisely because of that problem by this community of individuals. Um, yes, he bit the hand that it fed him, but uh, you know they, he was seen as a reaction to the decay, not bringing the decay on himself. So while I agree with you that maybe the era is shifting, I guess I would posit this. Isn't the real danger not the decay of these things that may never have been real in the first place, but rather the idea that perhaps China is now so enthused by its own success, as you pointed out earlier in your comments, that they now feel they have room to abandon the pragmatism, which I think is the core of your book, um, that they followed before, and shift back to the ideology bits a little bit. And um, I actually think what you highlight on the ideology stuff is more important than the politics, per se, because one drives the other. So I just welcome your views on that. No, those are, I mean, those are, those are, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I would... I would so you're, the reason why I use that when we're talking about sort of the, the 90s and the 2000s or the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, the term I use is partially political, partially institutionalized norms. So I mean, some people say, well, you know, there was never really any any norms to begin with because you know, uh, you know, it was you know, uh, 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 Deng Xiaoping you know exercised power from behind the scenes, and then you know Jiang Zemin was ex ex so it's all sort of there was, but I mean, I don't think that's totally true that there was never that was never anything that was you know important clearly you know Jiang Zemin did step down from his formal title and you know in military title in, in 2003 there was a trajectory that you could tell where it was possible for this stuff to begin to evolve in a particular direction and it didn't happen I think you're correct that the pivot is you know where and it isn't you I think you're correct also it's not just 2012 it happens before there's this pivot where people say you know those things aren't working out that well corruption is built up within the system because we've Fused money and party power in sort of a way in which we now have vested interests that are building up within the system, and we've got no independent checks that we can use to 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 corral, corral them. And so, therefore, the only possibility is to sort of make that move where you say we're going to 
start to give more leeway to, to sort of one individual to begin to clean it up. And he uses it in a very effective way to sort of aggregate power to himself. That's the story where I would say what's happening, happening is the system is cannibalizing itself. Precisely, 1989 was crucial because you could have given a signal at that point to sort of more steady reform of the system at large. Once that's taken off the table, I think then those later reforms in the 90s and early 2000s are doomed to sort of the one, one step forward, one step back, because the Tiananmen is always in the back of the minds of Chinese leaders. And so the system starts to cannibalize itself. It's, it cannibalizes itself by killing out those institutional reforms. Maybe on the economic front, it cannibalizes itself because then there's this desire to just keep pumping money into economic stimulus because we gotta keep the economy going even if it leads to latent problems. And the ultimate step is where you start to lose the pragmatism itself. And then you're like, okay, well then the only response to keep the system going if we're gonna concentrate power in an individual is to bring, bring, bring the ideology stuff back. But I, I do think that story of where it's almost like just eating itself, that's what I'm worried about. And I just think it continues. It's like you'll see more and more stuff get eaten, whether it's the openness to the outside, whether it's pragmatism, and it's going to just continue to go deeper and deeper into more institutions, and you're going to lose more and more of what you thought you understood China was since 78. Uh, and, and I just don't think it's stable. I know people are like, well, you know, we just need a strong leader, et cetera, but I think this, this kind of corrosive acid will just start to take away more and more of what we thought we knew since 78, and that will then lead to other stuff beginning to break through. I'm going to come up here in the front in just a second, but I just want, I want to take Chris's question and your reaction just for a second, just to, to push it to the, the clarity. So I, my sense is, is your story that you're telling is um, time's going along, uh, a variety of problems came about, and Xi Jinping had a specific type of solution to them, uh, centralization, getting rid of these sort of moderate norms, et cetera. And I think the question that, sh uh, that that Chris is asking is, is maybe that, that's the external story they're telling everybody, but maybe they had a different internal story, which was, we rock, we're awesome, uh, we are doing better than everybody else, uh, and, but we obviously need a way to justify this, and, uh, and our system is working better. Look what's going on in the Middle East, look what's going on else, what's going on in the US, and um, we tell everybody, uh, because we need them to hang on our every word that there's big problems and only the party can save China. But maybe uh, we, we are, maybe that's a, maybe actually they, they, they drink their own dojiang and they believe it, you know? Yeah, I, I, I do possible? think that there's an element of the whole, of the whole like, you know, 2008 Olympics, uh, World Financial Crisis, you start getting confident about like, oh, well, you know, you know, maybe this is the, why did we, we were launching those reforms in the 80s and 90s because we were worried about, you know, the yes. fundamental crisis within our system that we'd experienced in the Cultural Revolution. But by 2008, you're like, oh, well, you know, we, 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 maybe we need to address these problems, but, you know, the historical memories faded and everything else outside looks problematic, so maybe we were right to sort of just double down on our, yeah. yeah. So that's why the, the his, historians are going to be so important mm -hmm. to figure out what is that internal dynamic, right? dynamic and explanation that they give. We're gonna, right. You've been really patient. All right. Um, my name is Craig Fleener. I'm with the state of Alaska. Mm. And uh, I'm really interested in the economics of the discussion. And I guess it's very fascinating to me that you talk about the, the more of the inward uh, change and uh, some of the policy level changes and, and f focusing more inward, maybe uh, being more restrictive. But at the same time, uh, China is looking at investing billions, hundreds of billions in the One Belt, One Road project and building uh, a coalition all across Asia and Europe. And uh, this is important from the Alaska perspective because uh, China is actually our greatest buyer of, of Alaskan goods. And so it's, uh, it's really important to understand how what you're talking about is going to impact that. And if, it's, if there's truly this contraction going on, well, how does that play into the whole One Belt, One Road project? And, and recently, of course, they've added an Arctic component to that, which is important to Alaska as well. No, I mean, I think that's, that's a good question. I would sort of also invite Scott to participate in this, too. I mean, you know, my impression is that at least a part of the One Belt, One Road, to the extent that you're doing infrastructure developments overseas, 
this is a way of you know, taking some of China's experience in terms of building you know, very large infrastructure projects, including workers and including development. You can sort of replicate that overseas, and you know, this generates, this generates uh, investment, this, generate, this generates uh, growth, it generates employment, you know, you're funding. It, it, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of like stimulus, a continuation of the stimulus campaign, mm -hmm. but just directed overseas. Because many of the companies that are doing it are foreign, or Chinese workers that are actually doing it. So you're kind of more of the stimulus, and, but then, it's the, the, the debt is being racked up by the, many of the, 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 the partners who are uh, accumulating the, the debt to build. So the Sri Lankan port that mm -hmm. now. And so I think one of the questions that's going forward is like, what's going to be the result of that on the, you know, uh, what's the, su the success or failure of those projects abroad? Does it generate the revenue necessary to sort of to cover them? And that I don't know. But at least the one Sri Lankan port that was, Mm -hmm. the, the, they, they went bankrupt on the. Well, they have debt. They have debt. Yeah, okay. Yes. All right. So, I, I mean, Belt and Road is still pretty early, uh, early days. So, um, I think a lot of the variation depends on the g local governance uh -huh. of the societies where Belt and Road funds are going. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, places with bad governance tend to be happy to take on uh, Lots of unsustainable debt. debt. Ah, right. And right. and places like Alaska that are better governed will be better prepared to collaborate right. uh, in a way that fits Alaska's interests, uh, not right. necessarily right. the best. Because I think the Sri Lankans, they ended up like putting a whole bunch of money into that, and I think the Chinese got the 99-year lease on the port or something like that. I forget the, anyway. The, we'll come back to yeah, it. No, no, we, okay. We've got a lot That's of right. interest in the Belt and Road here, so we'll come back. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question here. We're going to go to this gentleman here, here unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Jerry Hyman. I'm a uh, non-resident here at CSIS. Uh, I was wondering if I could um, ask you to <clears throat> wonder if I could ask you to explain a little bit more, or, or spin out your thought a little bit more about tradition as a potential ideological support in case the um, system of we're great and just follow our lead turns into a little bit more stagnation, is, which is what you're suggesting. So part of the Chinese tradition is merito meritocracy and uh, exams without party influences. Didn't always work, but that was part of the basic tradition. Secondly, you had the problem of the bad empire, emperor. Thirdly, you had dynastic succession problems as part of the tradition with external and internal challenges to the imperial palace um, and fracturing internally. Uh, so tradition isn't totally one glossy road in, chi in China, and I wonder if they've thought at all, or maybe this just way down the road and they don't care right now about what kind of tradition they're talking about and how you continue that in the present um, uh, new era, as uh, Xi Jinping said. Or yeah. do you wind up with military autocracy if the political, if the economic system doesn't produce enough to support economic legitimacy? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, that's a really interesting question. I think you, you hit on, I mean, sort of, I think what the party is doing right now is it's creating a narrative about how tradition, I mean, the, the really interesting thing is that sort of, you know, the communist, the last thing in the world the Chinese Communist Party wants is a real communist party that's out there organizing workers in China. I mean, the, the workers are being expelled, the migrant workers are being expelled from Beijing, like, you know, kick them all, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, like last winter, and it's like, that's like the obverse of what you would be wanting. And reading the communist, it's like totally wrong. Uh, so the, 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 the party is very far from its roots as a revolutionary party. They're in the process of trying to sort of create a new clothing, a new rubric that fits them. But the problem is it's still technically the communist party. So they're really at odds ends. The ironic thing, which you're pointing out, is as, as you move towards tradition, as you move towards exams, that's actually the, re the reform era itself, 1978, 1970, 1977, 1978. If you're dating the beginning of the reform era, one of the key things people point to is the revival of the Gaokao in 70, uh, 77, 78. That huge legitimacy for Deng Xiaoping at that point, because that's like, for if you're a Chinese intellectual, you're like, bang, this is my route into the system. After 10 years of ideological chaos where the schools are closed, people are getting into university based on political connections and recommendations, finally, that is like the most meritocratic period in, in Chinese history. And the problem that you're dealing with as you move into an era where there's massive uh, expansion of numbers of people going into higher education, there's also massive corruption, uh, and there's an increasing ideological component, that's 
for all the people like Daniel Bell, who writes about Chinese meritocracy, I mean, the problem is China is moving further and further away from that concept of, of meritocracy rather than closer to it. And, uh, and that's actually one of the reasons. So I, I think you're correct that you know, they want to use this concept of tradition in a very sanitized way, but they're not really grappling with what it actually means. Uh, and uh, you know, I worry that that's also a source of losing legitimacy because you're, you're moving away from a range of roots. You're moving away from China's own imperial roots, you're, you're from real meritocracy. meritocracy. You're re moving away from anything res resembling equality, which was technically the Chinese communist you know, norm, in the, at least in the early Maoist era. And you're moving to something else, which is maybe just nationalism, which is what is it? And, and will people buy it if you ended up with sort of like the looming economic problems that sort of were out there? Anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I think your point's well taken about this doesn't really look like real tradition. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid that we've come uh, just about to the end. Uh, we want to make sure Carl has enough time to talk to you all informally as well as yeah. uh, sign books for anybody. Um, this is the best kind of big think that uh, we could engage in and that we need to engage in. Uh, there's so many issues uh, that China is facing, that we're facing, um, and you've given us a roadmap to think about those uh, and discuss them. Hopefully, we'll be discussing those with our colleagues in China. Uh, but we've learned a lot today, and we'll learn a lot from going through your book in more greater detail in the coming weeks and months. Everyone, please join me in thanking Carl. Thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. That was really good. Perfect. Perfect.